Welcome to Samutsari, Conversations with Mimi, a weekly podcast by Dinosocial, also a member of the Guerrilla Podcast Syndicate. Samutsari is where we can show that ordinary people do extraordinary things. Tune in to be entertained and to learn something new with your host, Mimi Lorilla. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Samutsari Conversations with Mimi a podcast featuring hot topics and other topics of interest for men and women alike. We always feature guests in the show who share their passion and commitment to their profession or talents. And here at Samutsari, we share stories to inspire you, stories from ordinary people who make extraordinary things. Um, as everyone knows, Season 2 is all about people who are working online, people who are business um, owners, uh, freelancers, virtual assistants, uh, people who are in businesses or in areas of interest that had pivoted online. But it's not to say that we uh, do not pause the focus of season two to interview people with uh, very exciting and interesting stories. So today is one of them. We want to welcome back to the show teacher Raquel from season one. So in season one, Raquel and I talked about uh, you being a teacher and your your teaching style, teaching pedagogy, we talked about play. Uh, but today yes. we will talk about something else. But before that, Raquel, can you greet the listeners and the viewers of Samutsari? Hello, everyone. And thank you, Mimi, for inviting me again for another Chica. Yes. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have Chica with you. Yes. Um, it's, um, it's very relaxing and we get to talk about topics that I really enjoy um, sharing with other people. Yeah, and it's not just what you enjoy. I think what we're going to talk about today is really important. <laughs> so to reveal, <laughs> yes, yes. let's have a big reveal. So ladies and gentlemen, Raquel and my topic for today's episode is about the effects of COVID-19 or learning during the pandemic to little kids or preschoolers. Um, and that's those kids who are age three to five maybe some of them are six it just depends on uh the levels that the schools are offering but for raquel's school she is the um she's a teacher and mentor of grade th uh, of age three and four right age three and four if i'm four not and five year old four and five okay so why is this an important topic i think the reason why we've chosen to talk about this is because there are so many parents that after a year of adjusting to life in lockdown or life in within the environment of COVID-19, we still have mm -hmm. not settled into a proper routine or we still have not mm -hmm. nailed the strategies on how to teach and learn in this unprecedented environment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you are in the thick and in the middle of that storm. Um, yeah. So, can you give me something like a brief overview of how your school managed teaching these little kids during the pandemic? Is there a specific routine, new routine that you have established, mm -hmm. or were you just adjusting depending on lockdown situations mm -hmm. or whatnot? So yeah. Give us a yeah. little bit of a flavor in terms of what's happening so in the school. Yeah, so definitely the lockdown um, uh, made our the number of children that were attending in our center to start with the earliest lockdown because there were so many, everyone had to go and uh, stay home. Everyone except the essential workers are allowed to go to work. So that means there was a big drop in attendance in our center. So yep. if, just to give you an overview, our center is 120 play center. But during the first lockdown, we probably had around about um, 25 to 30% capacity. So that means we had five rooms and that, mean, that meant that all of the rooms could not operate um, individually. So which means that there was a big change, especially in routine for children. So we had to group all of the younger age groups in one room and all, most of the older age groups in another room. And um, just an example, the babies and the toddlers were grouped together, which which has a big disparity when it comes to developmental milestones and things like that. Also, 
Um, one of the other challenges aside from changing routines. So the challenges for the children that, was, that were still attending the services, these are um, children mostly of um, uh, essential workers. So technically they're already coming in with the knowledge that why am I coming here and where are my friends? So because their parents are essential workers and there's, there's a level of, you know, there's a level of anxiety there because pa essential workers are the nurses, the doctors, everyone from the medical profession, which was most, most of our essential workers were from the medical profession because we had two big, uh, two big hospitals in the area where I, where I work. So there was already a level of anxiety from within the family setting that, you know, my parents might be able might contract the virus because they're in a very exposed um, work environment. So th they come into the center and they would go, where are my friends? And, and they, they have to do with other friends, other children that they don't know, which, you know, as, as per child's development, when you, you put children out of their normal routine, then there's a lot of behavior and social changes that would occur. We didn't see that at the start, but we definitely struggled to cope with the change in routine, especially with, with educators, because some of us had to stay home while others had to be, you know, others that don't know any of these children had to, had to care and educate for the children in their room, which is about 20, 20 children over the three to five age group. Mm -hmm. so, we definitely um, responded as the lockdown uh, unfolded and we had to change all of most of our uh, managed like uh, system strategy uh, during those periods of lockdown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, th thank you for the summary, which me brings me to several things that we can um, unpack based on yeah. uh, what you have mentioned. So the first thing that you mentioned a while ago was the big drop in your attendance. And yes. this is not because you were turning away those kids. It is no. because there was a rule when we were told as parents, you have to keep yep. your kids with you as much as you mm. can. Stay at home yep. with and only the children mm. of essential workers are mm -hmm. permitted or yep. um, have the option of going yeah. to, to the school. And how about the mm. number of the teachers? Um, is it because you have to practice social distancing that the rostering changed? Mm -hmm. Or is it because some of the teachers yes. cannot go to work because of uh, funding issues? Because I remember uh, in other countries, if you're not working, you're not paid. But in your yeah, case... Yeah, we were paid. Okay, so in your case, the, the yeah, we were paid um, a combination safe. of the job seeker. Mm. Yeah, our jobs were safe, but uh, because of social distancing at work, because imagine it's 120 place, the children 25% at capacity, so we don't really need everyone to be. That's right. Dead. So it's a function of so the number of for safety for safety of everybody yeah. and for social distancing. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the other um, thing that you mentioned is the essential workers. So mm -hmm. the parents of the kids are working and the kids are lamenting or are being confused mm -hmm. or yeah. are um, not really confused, but uh, in Tagalog, nagtataka silao. They are wondering, mm -hmm. why am yeah. I in school and why are some of my friends not in school? Is Definitely, that something yeah. negative to the kids? Like, have they said that because they just genuinely miss their friends or they are mad at their parents for sending them to school when they can stay at yeah. home? So which one is yeah. it? Um, I think they're just missing the most. Most it's the social connections. They're definitely missing the social connections. And especially at the first two weeks of lockdown where, you know, Parents were unsure, am I an essential worker or am I not an essential worker? So they might have not come to kinder on a Monday and Tuesday, but then the government has decided that this industry are essential workers. So they, the parents would have been given a pass 
So then on the third day or on the fourth day of the lockdown, they, they went to, to kinder. So the shift is definitely, but um, earlier on, and I think it's the ethos of our work environment as well, that um, we really make sure that we, um, we inform children in a language that is accessible to them of what is, hap what is happening around them. So we had storybooks about, um, we have social stories about hand washing, uh, the distance the, and the, why people are wearing masks and things like that. So those were the things that we had to scramble, really scramble at the start of the lockdown to put in place so that we can support the, I guess, the emotional um, well-being of children so that they will know, ah, this is what's happening in a language that they would understand. That's right. So we, will have, we will have dots on the carpet to make sure that, you know, yeah. and everyone calls the virus different kinds of names. Some mm. calls it Rona, so, mm. you know, it was, but yeah, they were all, you know, they were all validated and children would talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So just to remind those people who have just tuned in, Raquel and I am talking about preschoolers and their learning during the pandemic because we hear more stories about the effect of the pandemic to the mental health of more mature students, maybe the, the ones that are uh, uni, uh, university level students that are uh, scared of what the future might bring them because of the job opportunities and then the high school leavers the ones that are year 11s year 12s that are moving into college they have a lot of examinations sometimes we forget that the little kids are also <laughs> hugely um, affected as well so i remember mm -hmm. in one of our previous conversations you said you attended this conference of more than 300 teachers, am I correct? In the whole yeah. of Korea. And mm -hmm. high in your agenda was the discussion around mental health of these little kids. And yeah. you mentioned anxiety. Um, mm. So this is not like something that is already readily available as part of literature or as a journal article. But I think mm. my suspicion is most of the discussions that you're having it's far around what's it now, what's happening now. It might not be documented yeah. formally, but it's a recurring mm. theme that the kids yeah, are the kids are also ha um, experiencing anxiety. Yeah. Can you explain the kind of anxiety that little kids are experiencing as a result of the changes in their learning within this environment? Yeah. So um, the 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 best. Um, a, bit, a portrayal of anxiety that I've seen from children. Um, the first one was anger. There was a lot of angry, um, not angry emotions, but um, just frustration, anger over little things, anger if someone just touches them that we don't, we, I never really saw prior to the, the big change with COVID. And another thing is the heightened, there was a, the, there was a very uh, big shift in the energy level of children. It was just um, like pure energy that they had to expand, but it wasn't productive energy. It was like a like a sort of steaming. Like they could they couldn't understand what was happening around them, and they were trying to um, cope with that by just spinning around and around. You know, like if if I have to to um, make a mental picture of it, it's like a person just spinning around and around because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of energy that they were displaying pretty much for a whole six months. Yeah, it, it, um, it started really, really high and it continued on that trajectory until there was sort of some, some semblance of normality where we had that first coming out of lockdown thing. Mm -hmm. But then we had another, you know, they, we had to have another shift. Mm -hmm. And then that went back again to that high level of energy. And those are the two main things that I thought, this is something that could be for adults. Because as you know, children don't have the capacity to really, um, you know, um, explain why am I feeling this way? Or what's the reason why I'm getting angry or why I'm getting upset? You know, they, mm -hmm. don't, they don't have the emotional maturity to, to understand what is happening to them mm -hmm. today you know, to their emotions yeah. and things. But yeah. they definitely manifested it in a lot of um, negative energy. Yeah, the behaviors. So we're not yeah. saying that these kids have turned themselves into, um, what do you call that? 
uh, for a lack of a better term, from being a normal kid to a kid with a possible learning disability or no, no, emotion, no. It, they're just manifesting a certain level mm. of frustration and uncertainty yep. of what's happening to them yep. that they cannot explain. Yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah. You know, and and you said you have to kind of adjust your day to yep. uh, probably managing more of the anxiety mm. than. Yep. Then introducing more lessons or introducing mm-hmm. new things to them because yep. no matter probably how much you try, if they're not yeah. listening and concentrating, then what's yeah. the point of introducing those those new lessons? Yes, how definitely. What did you shift? And how did you shift your learning priorities during that time? Well, luckily, because remember on the first podcast, I talked about really the importance of play in learning concepts. So we've already got that established in the workplace. So we just had to step back a little bit into uh, play and conceptual understanding and really finding uh, teachable moments in in during the times where we had to deal with emotional regulations. Say so for example, when we have uh, like, when we have social distancing, we had dots on the floor. So we would talk about, okay, how many dots do we have today? So how 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 many steps is the distance between those dots? So there's, you know, they, you're talking about math concepts, but you're pulling it down to what's actually happening. Why are we having to social distance? How much arm length, you know, how much is the distance between your friend and your other friend? Show me, you know, how, how many arm lengths, how many steps do you need to be away from your friend? So little things like that, you're still working on numeracy concepts, but you all, you know, it's it's grounded on what they actually have, been, they're actually experiencing at the moment. So we would have, you know, mask decorating masks and things like that, you know, um, germs we talked about germs we talked about germs a lot for science we made experiments of things like that so it was still there was still a lot of um there was still a lot of opportunities to really hone in on conceptual understanding with all areas of learning except that there was less of it and more of um mindfulness reading stories to them making sure that they are outside because Part of one of the things where they have so much high energy is because when they get home, they just go home. They don't go outside. They don't go to the park. A lot of them don't have older siblings that go to footy on the weekend. They don't get to do that. So we had to we, we had to be mindful that there was not a lot of um, you know opportunities to engage those large muscles. And the only time they get to do it is when they come to kinder. Mm. So we had to provide all of those opportunities, which which we normally do, but not on a higher, on a bigger scale. Yeah, it's something like a modified simulation of what it would look like in pre-COVID time. Yes, <laughs> definitely. How do you definitely. play with a friend without touching the friend too yeah. much? How do you yeah, play definitely. with a friend without, you know, affecting... Uh, affecting and them? I think that was the hardest. Mm. The hardest that I find, even for me as well, is the the t- the being being in close proximity to others because you know they're still four and five years they still want to sit on your lap when you're yeah. reading them a story and it was really you know it was really difficult to uphold the social distancing and at the same time you know uh de- help them with the emotional regulation because if mm-hmm. you're crying you, you mm-hmm. know you can't say Okay, okay. You gotta <laughs> hug them. You yeah, know, you yeah, yeah. Do those things. So, but you're mindful all the time. Is this, you know, is this then diminishing my social distancing rules That's and right. things like that? Yeah. So, so it's like earlier our, on, I think socialization has completely changed for little kids. Yeah. But they, yeah. what they know to be what the normal is, is no longer. Mm-hmm the normal yeah. right now so you yeah mentioned- and i think that's part of where the 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 anxiety and all of that has um, really heightened mm. so you mentioned that you kind of integrate um concepts around covid uh, in your daily tasks and in the mm. learnings um, for example in science do you honestly think that the kids have sufficient knowledge or just the right amount of knowledge on covid what it means to them at their mm-hmm. age now and what it means to society now 
or do you think this is just like a passing phase like later yeah. on in their life they won't won't really remember too much of how they they learned about it in school um because i think that um with the anxiety they they will be overly conscious about hygiene mm. and overly conscious yep, about yeah. safety mm. But yeah. is that sufficient or is that scaring them? I just want to know um, how how teachers like you would approach this. Because as mm-hmm. a parent, I would probably just, um, you know, brush it aside. Like, okay, we're mm-hmm. living now in this sort of times. Everybody yeah. has to adjust. My kids yeah. and older kids alike. But in the school setting, yeah. what's, what's happening there? Is it um, as real as it can be or is it like a mm-hmm. passive fancy? Um, definitely this year we've seen an increase in, you know, um, hygiene practices that the children doesn't have to be reminded to wash, wash mm-hmm. their hands. Um, other children who are very good at it actually reminds the children who they see are not. So the takeaway from this is that we, we probably might have um, adults that are a bit more germaphobe <laughs> than if you know, we didn't go through the COVID or another example would be, you know, a bit more reserved because of the social distancing The you know, they're not able to um, build those social connections. And we're now on our second year of COVID and we're still not normal. We, we still haven't returned to the norm. We've got a new COVID normal, but you know, we still haven't returned to that. And this year we've, we've actually, you know, I, the only thing I've seen this year is that the height and hygiene, you know, understanding of children. But hopefully it doesn't impact on their social connections. The thing that came out of it on a positive note is that they were able to be more resilient and have built better friendships within mm-hmm. within the within the center. Mm-hmm. So I with that in mind, I'm a bit more positive when it comes to that the you know the impact of what happened now to the to, to when they they go out hopefully mm-hmm. they're not they you know if the friends are not available then they can pivot and find new friends or make new connections That's rather right. than you know isolate themselves okay because that was one of the positives right so thinking about that conference that you attended <laughs> and the general sentiment of the teachers what's yeah. the top three worry of your sector your early childhood sector what what are you guys worried about yeah um so i think um covid just heightened what was already um a recurring issue in the early childhood field anyway so this uh, this data uh this data collection that started in 2012 i think and it goes for every three years and so it goes 2012, 2015, 2018. And there's another one that's coming up now, which is very interesting. And from the first data of 2012 up to now, um, the high proportion of children vulnerable and at risk are in the areas of social and emotional development. So it's always been a given. Mm. Not There wasn't a year where there was a plateau. There was, you know, in my I'm talking about my local area, but I think globally for Victoria, uh, for Victoria, I think the the trend is that the social and emotional development of children in Victoria, there's a lot of vulnerable and at risk in that area. And it's always been the case. Mm-hmm. And if we get the data in 2021, we, we are expecting that it's there's going to be um, a shift, a, a bigger surge in the at risk and vulnerable area. Our problem is that a lot of this, one of the sentiments of the teachers is that there was one, um, there was one, um, one of the panel uh, that talked about her experience. She's the early childhood awardee of the year, two years ago. And she was saying this year and last year, it was not only the emotional and well being of children that she was um, supporting, but she was also support. She was also trying to manage her own yeah. emotional well-being. And that's where it gets really hard because mm-hmm. you can't draw from an empty cup. That's right. And that's the main sentiment of the whole uh, 
profession is that if we're not emotionally and uh, mentally robust, then we won't be able to model emotional and uh, mental robustness with children. Mm -hmm. And that was the overwhelming consensus at that mm -hmm. uh, training seminar that I attended. Wow. Which leads me to my next question. So do you think that in your new COVID normal, the whole curriculum might be changed, that there will be some recommendations on how teachers can deliver the lessons. There's There will be a different set of routines or timetable or yeah. progression that will be developed, which is um, something that they need to do quickly. Something like the development of the vaccines <laughs> in yeah. order to meet the demand yeah. of herd yeah. immunity, we need the vaccines. Now, in order to meet the demands of this behavioral yeah. and the knowledge base and everything, yeah. so that's one component of it. And then, as you said, um, what about retraining the teachers themselves? Will this require yeah. teachers to be trained so that you can be equipped? So, like you said, how yeah. can you, how can you, uh, you know, do if your cup is empty? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. What yeah. do you say about that? Do you think that's something that's going to be happening soon? Um, so with the way that our framework works, a curriculum framework for the early childhood, it's um it's very much based on building relationships and recognizing the here and the now of children. So when it comes to tailoring your curriculum approach, we have a lot, we have a big, big leeway for that because we can interpret the framework. In, in ways that we can work around um, outcomes and things like that while responding to the current needs of the children. So that's not an issue. I, I guess what what the issue is for the parents, and this is what I'm, you know, because parents, there's a big gap between an, the understanding of parents of how they see their child as being ready for school and how we see their child as being ready for school. There's a big gap. Because especially with us Filipinos, we talk about, you know, she has to be able to write and read and things like that. And clearly in Australia, that is not an expectation when you're going to school. The expectation is that you have an understanding that letters represent something. You're able to form letters and things like that. But really, there's not an under understanding that you have to, you know, be able to write long sentences. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so that's where that's where the challenge would be is the disconnect. And but in saying that, because I think parents are parents who were homeschooling their children really really see oh this is how it is you know this is how my child learns in school and now they have a, a more compassionate understanding of our profession. So I think that's where the positive of COVID of children going on, you know, remote learning and things like that, is that they have a better appreciation of how difficult it is to teach children concepts uh, and things like this. So that's right. I think that's where where the good lies. Yeah. So do you predict that in the future the framework would include more parent input? Uh, a greater portion of the learning will be through the parents' intervention. So it's not just relying solely on the teacher, but yep. it's a joint, yeah. joint yeah. team now, team at home and team at school, helping the child to learn in this, in yep. this new environment. Yeah. That's the future. Yeah, I think, um, I think historically the problem has always been, the, the, the industry has always been open to uh, participation, parent participation, but the, the parents, on the other hand, um, has been very, um, their their response to it has been very lackluster. So, you know, and I think that will, it has been, it has been historically been like that. And I think it will continue to be like that unless we, we, we as a, in the sector, create more ways, more innovative ways to honor, you know, what the problems, what the um, the gaps are, why why they're not having, why they're not having the time to participate. So, you know, we we have to think of 
other really clever ways how parents can make some contribution to to our setting mm. and um there's a lot of initiatives around it but i think it will always be you have to go you have to always come up with those initiatives because yeah. on the part of the parents there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are impacting the their participation time is one of them yeah because yeah, we're sure. they're over scheduled we have yeah, over scheduled right. parents <laughs> like as it's you know really hard. it's really hard but anyway yeah. regardless of where an early childhood teacher works all over the world what would be your message to them as a person in the same sector or as a colleague uh what, 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 at what this time would you advise them yeah yeah they might be experiencing some level of anxiety themselves as a teacher or maybe as some level yeah. of frustration because of what's happening um you are there you've been there you're doing it um share your thoughts and final message to them yeah i think um to just breathe you know for everything just breathe if 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 your plan is not working breathe refocus and because i think breathing is looking after your mental well-being and that's the most important because you can't really you can't you can't really you know give from an empty cup so if find ways where you know like we've incorporated mindfulness in the classroom because we need the mindfulness ourselves we need time to just be quiet and mm-hmm. we can't just say to the children be quiet so we have to find ways where everyone can you know find their calm find their find their quiet and um don't be too hard on yourself that's you know i've, I've always had to especially this time last year this year to not be too hard on yourself because you you're doing whatever you, what's the best that you can do in in circumstances where no one's no one's ever been in this kind of circumstances before so whatever you're doing is the right thing to you to do in these circumstances mm, that's right so they don't have to beat themselves too much or yeah definitely not, yeah and i do that a lot of the times yeah. but then you know you can't work from a, from an empty vessel yeah <laughs> they need to also forgive themselves and yeah. um, be a little yeah. bit kinder to themselves <laughs> yeah yeah cuz um, teachers are uh uh are a breed all their own because you know they're doing so much but they don't think that they're doing enough better enough yeah mm-hmm. and i don't know why the profession has that but we do you know we always have that what can i do what can what else can i do whereas you just have to say well i've done the best to that tomorrow you know i might do a bit better yeah so take one day at a time essentially yes definitely breathe about the, take one the day future. at a time and don't beat yourself too much <laughs> yeah that's great so rachel i really appreciate you coming to the program today to the show today and it's really enlightening to hear um things outside my own little bubble <laughs> um because i'm out of touch with uh, early childhood um i'm more in touch with the um, the uni level mm-hmm. students because yeah. i work so it's good to know and to learn about your perspective and how the sector is doing and how everything's going as far as uh learning teaching and uh, surviving thriving in in a <laughs> pandemic learning situation yeah so, again for your time today um and i've asked you for your message so if you don't have anything uh else to add then we can uh finish off the show so um for people who have been watching us if you have any stories or topics you wish to teach If you'd like Raquel to come back and talk about more early childhood learning stuff, just contact us through the Samutsari podcast at gmail.com address. Samutsari is a member of the Guerrilla Podcast Syndicate. You can also reach out to me via my Facebook page, obviously YouTube and my Twitter account. Don't forget to like, subscribe and um, you know, tune in to other Guerrilla Podcast uh, programs and obviously Samut Sari Conversations with Mimi. Thanks, Raquel, for your time. Thank you, Mimi. Thanks, everyone. This is not the end. There will be more future <laughs> chica between the two of us. <laughs> so, of course. Uh, yeah. So we'll see each other again soon. Okay? Yes. Thanks, Mimi. Bye. If you find value in this episode, 
Make sure you like and subscribe to be notified of new releases. If you have any questions or suggestions, please reach out to Gorilla Podcast or send us an email at mimi at dinosocial.com. Spread the word and don't forget to tune in next time.